I am pleased to introduce our next speaker, Inez Acevedo, who will be speaking on the topic of behavior and environmental justice. Inez is a professor in the Department of Energy Resources Engineering at Stanford, and the title of her talk is Decarbonized or Green Energy Systems Does Not Equal Equitable Energy Systems. Over to you, Inez. Thank you so much for the introduction, Sarah. Um, there is an enormous importance on decarbonizing the energy system, but that doesn't necessarily equate with um, equitable energy systems. So while decarbonization in itself is a daunting and challenging task that we need to start yesterday, we need to take into account also other sustainability aspects tied to environmental justice. And these relate to how the transitions and solutions that we propose for decarbonization may help also improve or deteriorate issues like air quality and air pollution health consequences. The distribution of the economic burden associated with the deployment of green technologies, the access to the adoption of green technologies and jobs, and ju this just to name a few. So I'll start uh, by highlighting um, some of the recent work um, tied to um, access to technology and how policies influence the outcomes of technology adoption. Um, so Craig mentioned some of these um, perhaps smaller, more modular source of technologies for decarbonization. Um, solar is an early example for, for, for that. And what this picture is showing, this plot is, um, a comparison between the average, um, uh, the median household income by county and the distribution of early and more recent adoption of solar PV. So in blue, we have the distribution of um, income by county in green and to the rightmost side, um, the adoption of solar PV systems installed in uh, 2006. And in red, and kind of in the middle of this plot, the adoption of solar PV systems in 2014. And this plot makes the point that early adopters, and surprisingly, were um, mostly high income households benefiting from the system uh, that was in place for solar subsidies. So the same amount of subsidies by household may not be the most equitable solution for the adoption of those technologies. And we can envision that other types of technologies would suffer from the same sort of issues, thinking about uh, home um, so, uh, storage um, devices, uh, vehicle electrification, and so on and so forth. Now, the other aspect that I would like to raise related to distributional effects is that while we do need uh, energy the, currently in the system as we have it, we have the implications for climate change, but yet the other implication from the systems as they operate currently relying on fossil fuels, we have very serious health damages from air pollution. And so this constitutes a problem in terms of who suffers from those damages, when and where. So as we think about the usage of fossil fuels and uh, the consequences of removing potentially um, GHGs and not air pollutants or removing both, we'll look at very different um, consequences. So uh, notably, GHGs will have a global dispersion and will stay in the atmosphere for a very long time. Whereas um, a co-emission that potentially will occur depending on technology and choices would be the emissions of things like SO2, NOx and PM, which will have um, health damaging consequences, both in the form of primary PM 2.5 emitted, as well as the secondary formation of PM 2.5 from the emission of SO2, NOx and ammonia. And now the issue is that those effects are gonna be much more localized um, there is still going to be a distribution that will need to be modeled. Um, the effects, for example, from the stack of a, a, a coal power plant um, will have a large and long dispersion, but are not going to um, remain for a long period of time in the atmosphere. And so how do we contrast those two issues, namely under the lenses of um, technological change and adoption of new green technologies? Not only that, but as we think about different types of services um, that will be produced, whether it's electricity or mobility, the types of emissions currently associated with that 
uh, will be fairly different and different, uh, differently distributed in space and time too, even just across the criteria pollutants. So the consequences will depend on whether the emissions are from a very high stack of a coal power plant that you're using to charge a vehicle in India, or um, an internal combustion uh, gasoline powered vehicle that is running very densely populated areas uh, like New Delhi. So I'll provide an example. This is, um, to our knowledge, uh, the first paper that looked at the issue in this detail, where with call colleagues Manager Thing, Chris Tesson, and Julian Marshall, we developed um, a quantification of the distributional effects from air pollution from the US electricity sector. And so as we think about the adoption of new technologies, we can contrast to what is being removed uh, or displaced from the grid as it operates today. Um, and why the environmental justice aspect? Well, we may think that yes, the grid is getting cleaner over time, but electricity generation, even in the United States, is still a significant contributor to air pollution, namely associated with coal plants. Um, even if that has declined thanks to environmental regulations and the transition from coal to natural gas, and to some extent to renewables. Um, so when we look at the, the, the grid in the United States today, it still accounts from somewhere between uh, 10,000 and 52,000 per meter deaths per year. There is uncertainty associated with the air quality model that is being used. And the demographic uh, distribution resulting from the exposure to this uh, pollution is largely unknown. So what we've done is to estimate the exposure and health impacts from both primary and secondary PM associated with electricity operations across the United States in each uh, regional transmission organization or RTO uh, for each state, as well as by income and race. And so I'll jump to the results from this modeling. This plot shows on the vertical axis, the premature mortality uh, per 100,000 people associated with the operation of electricity generating units in the United States. And the horizontal axis shows um, the self-reported race and ethnicity. And so um, across the United States, we have um, 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 people suffering um, an average of 5.3 premature deaths per 100,000 people. And we see that um, uh, Black and African-American people suffer uh, more higher values than the overall population uh, average, followed by white non-Latino with the other self-reported race and ethnicity suffering low, lower values of premature mortality. Now, importantly, this effect doesn't disappear by income. Yet again, in the uh, vertical axis, we have premature mortality per 100,000 people, and the horizontal axis show, uh, shows household income groups. Um, and so we see that um, higher income groups suffer less or are located in regions where uh, they suffer uh, less in terms of premature mortality from exposure to air pollution. Um, and we see that across all income groups, Black African Americans suffer from higher exposure uh, than the average and then white non latino and that this effect doesn't dissipate with income, it continues to persist. Now, that's one dimension of distributional effects. Yet another one is uh, how the, do air pollution's consequence relate to where pollution is emitted and who suffers the burden of those emissions. So this first plot shows a premature mortality um, uh, in the form of total annual deaths uh, that occur within a state. Uh, regardless of where the emissions occur. Uh, so the emissions may occur in a very distant state, and this reports the values that the state suffers. So this is that's within state. And we see some states like uh, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Ohio suffering very large uh, figures in terms of premature mortality. Now, we decompose this in terms of damages that are imposed by the emissions that occur between the state. So kind of self-induced damages on this plot B. And we see that, for example, uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio have much lower values in this case, meaning that the emissions that occur in those 
um, uh, state contribute still for fairly high values, but much less than what is the observed total premature death toll uh, in the state. Now, the other uh, distributional effect consequences is looking at the damages to others. And so in this plot, we show kind of the export of premature mortality caused by a state. And so we do see that um, places like uh, Pennsylvania and Ohio have, um, uh, uh, um, are contributing to a large number of premature deaths that are not uh, uh, occurring between the state boundaries, but are occurring elsewhere. And finally, we have a net uh, sort of effect and highlighting here that a state like New York, where um, the um, premature debts that are imposed by self or to others are uh, extremely small, see an enormous number of imported debts. Basically, it is importing the pollution from other states and suffering its consequences um, on an issue that they have little control over. So key findings from this portion of the work is that um, there are very important distributional consequences associated with the grid as it is today that should inform the grid of the future as we think about um, heavy um, decarbonization of both the grid and other sectors. Uh, we find that the average exposures for, are the highest for Black and African American followed by non-Latino uh, white. Um, and the exposures for remaining groups are uh, somehow lower. Um, the disparities are observed for each income cate category, uh, and this indicates that the racial and ethnic differences in exposure hold even after accounting for differences in income. Uh, we also see key differences across states on who emits and who suffers the consequences from air pollution. Um, and finally, for 36 states, most of the health impacts are attributable to emissions to other states. Um, highlighting the need for consolidated action and coordination across states uh, as we think about both air pollution and um, um, carbon policy. Which leads me to the second piece that I would like to highlight. Um, this piece in uh, ESNT uh, was co authored with one of my former students, Brian Sergi, um, as well as several colleagues with expertise in air quality and in environmental uh, economics. And so the issue here was, uh, can we look at the decarbonization of the US power sector and they're both the climate and health benefits lenses. And also what does that mean for distributional effects uh, related to health? So um, the challenge and motivation here is that climate policies often quantify as a side co-benefit improvements in air quality, um, but they we haven't seen really uh, detailed treatments of those two issues together in terms of understanding um, what would be the optimal strategies uh, across reducing damages from air pollution and, and climate change, and whether that changes a lot from looking at climate change alone. So we did that. We, we basically developed a capacity retirement and expansion, and expansion model uh, for the US grid and looked at what would be the optimal investment in new generating capacity and their different types of objectives and constraints. And the objectives were to either just meet um, a, a climate um, change mitigation goal of reducing the emissions by 30%, or explicitly optimizing for um, a minimization of the damages from both air pollution and climate change while at the same time still meeting that constraint of hitting a 30% emissions reductions. And we do several simplifying assumptions. Uh, we assume that the new capacity will need to be built in the same county where a plant is being uh, retired. Uh, so we ignore issues related to transmission constraints. And we'll look at uh, just a few options. And those options are natural gas, um, as well as wind and solar where for wind and solar, we assume that they do need to be paired up with storage uh, to provide exactly the same service as the coal power plant that uh, is being retired. So I'll jump directly on the results and I'll, I'll be happy to uh, talk 
uh, much more in detail about the modeling offline. The vertical axis provides the annual damages in billion dollars, uh, and we'll show those from, from climate change related damages and air pollution damages. The baseline is the system as it operates today. And so we see um, uh, the climate change damages, which we value at the social cost of carbon of $40 per ton of CO2, uh, being uh, 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 around $70 billion. Uh, and the air quality uh, related damages from premature mortality um, depend on the air quality model that you assume and the concentration response function. So here we are like already in this results, the sensitivity associated with that given its importance. So if one uses the Harvard Six um, CT study, the, um, the health damages associated with air pollution are actually even higher than the climate change damages. Um, if we assume the ACS study, they are smaller, but kind of in the same um, sort of broad order of magnitude as the climate change uh, damages too. And the different symbols correspond to different uh, reduced form air quality models that can be used to relate emissions to concentration and to damages of air pollution. Now, this is the baseline alone. And now when we think about um, just uh, climate uh, only policy, uh, what are the, the results from, from such? So when we impose climate change um, uh, reductions of 30% uh, emissions, of course, the emissions do reduce by 30% and we see a decline in the associated damages. And we have a co-benefit in terms of the air pollution reduction that goes with it, given that the model selects to uh, remove a lot of the existing coal power plants and replace them with either natural gas or a renewables plus storage. Now, importantly, if we explicitly include health uh, damages and climate damages and try to minimize those together in the objective function, we see a further reduction in health damages uh, and their consequences. So the question that follows is, um, is that more costly and how much more costly can that be? So in this next plot, we show both the annual benefits as well as the mitigation costs from pursuing a climate only strategy versus explicitly incorporating health damages as well as the climate goals. And we see that the costs when doing so in terms of deployment of technologies increase by a little bit, but we still see net benefits all across by incorporating those two things together. Um, so we, this uh, suggests that policymakers could look at those policy policies together and even improve on the net benefits associated from those emissions reductions. Now, um, this uh, talk was motivated by equity and environmental justice. So one of the things that we pursued in this uh, scenario is to understand how um, the health um, uh, damages are reduced when we impose just a climate policy or a climate plus health damages policy by income quantile. And so the good news is that we see um, benefits across all uh, income levels. Uh, and we see those benefits being even larger if we were to explicitly incorporate health plus climate policies. And we see that the benefits are the largest for uh, lower income quantiles. Um, now, the same effect is not seen um, by um, minority quantiles. So this is the same uh, plot as uh, previously, uh, but in this case, in the distribution from um, the uh, minorities that exist in the county uh, being assessed. Um, and, and so we see that regions that have um, lower amounts of uh, minorities represented are the ones that harvest uh, the largest portion of the benefits. Um, this uh, changes, of course, are also going to be very different from state to state. If we can, we can consider just a climate policy versus a climate plus um, uh, damages from air pollution policy. So um, the in this plot, the orange bars correspond to climate only policies, and the blue bars correspond to policies related to 
health uh, plus climate. Um, the bars correspond to new capacity that would need to be installed in a state to achieve the goals of the policy. Uh, whereas on the right hand side in this axis and with the black diamonds, we show the amount of capacity, the share of capacity uh, that would need to be replaced in a state. Um, and so we see major differences across some of the states when we go from one scenario to uh, uh, another. So I'll end here and open it up for questions and hopefully this will spur uh, a, a discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Inez. Okay, so there's clearly an economic impact of poor air quality on things like uh, health costs and uh, worker productivity, things of that nature. Is this on the order of magnitude that policymakers take notice? It is indeed on the order of magnitude that uh, policymakers should take notice. So the evidence of that would be the figure that I um, just showed where we computed just the annual damages for climate change and the annual damages in terms of premature mortality from health. And they're kind of in the same ballpark. And depending on what you assume for the social cost of carbon, we could have a three hour long discussion on what that should be and the implications of such and the uncertainty associated with these air quality models. But they are definitely uh, in uh, orders of magnitude that should be considered and should be considered together. Um, and that um, policymakers should indeed take notice. Um, if anything, in most instances, this will provide also the outcome of larger net benefits to society from um, more stringent levels of carbon emissions adoptions, at least in the very large instances where the criteria pollutants also are reduced. There are some questions where tensions arise, and so I didn't show that, but if you are thinking about electrifying in regions like in India currently, where you would be charging your vehicles with a coal power grid where scrubbers and other air pollution control technologies are not installed, the effect could be actually increasing the damages rather than decreasing the damages altogether. And we've shown, we have some work showing that. I'll be happy to share with uh, interested participants. Okay, do you see a role for changes in uh, local air quality regulations at the state or federal uh, level, like the changes to the Clean Air Act or anything like that? Yes, that's uh, of course tremendously hard and the Clean Air Act is already a phenomenal achievement that we, we have in place. Um, but under the lenses of uh, state level policy, um, I, I would hope that those discussions indeed emerge and materialize in actual policy that takes do, the two aspects into consideration together. My sense is that we'll be missing opportunities and actually producing some serious unintended consequences if we don't. And do you see any policy coming or emissions crossing state borders could force changes in other states? Indeed, that's where both the cooperation and the negotiations may be extremely challenging. But given the magnitude of the impacts that we found uh, for some of these states, um, it's actually uh, quite surprising to me that they are not pushing harder already right now. So the effects that we've seen in New York, for example, extremely damaging for something that it's really not to their benefit. There is another layer that I didn't touch upon, which is um, who is consuming and producing the electricity. So we just talked about um, uh, imports and exports of consequences from air pollution. But we're having a grid that is, is really uh, so interconnected uh, that some of that uh, uh, electricity consumption may, may be related to those states that don't have units that are highly polluting but are still consuming the grid. So there is this really neat work by um, Jack DeShallander and Sally Benson that track the consumption-based um, emissions of CO2 across grids and um, pushing that further and uh, connecting that with the air pollution consequences may be an important next step. Okay, thank you so much, Inez. Really appreciate that. 